Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching from all over the world. I'm your friendly neighborhood philosopher, and with me now is your not so friendly neighborhood philosopher, Mike Jones, aka Inspiring Philosophy. How you doing, Mike? Good. How you doing? Uh, thanks for having uh, me back. How you doing? How you doing? What have you been? Uh, what have you been reading lately? You oh, seem a lot like of stuff you seem the, uh... you seem like a big reader. Yeah, uh, well, I got two books here I've been reading on the uh, critiquing the documentary hypothesis, huh. uh, exploring the composition of the Pentateuch, paradigm change of Pentateuchal research. That's what I've been reading a lot lately. Yeah. And we are going to go into uh, evidence for the Exodus. This is something I haven't really studied much in the past, so this will be uh, some good information for me as well. Before Mike starts talking, uh, are we roughly even on our audio? I know people were pointing out that I had a problem with, uh, uh, I was lower than Robert Spencer last time. I tried to get us about even this time, but does it sound about even? Go ahead and, uh, go ahead and say something about your site IP, but really it's just for the audio purposes. Of course. So yeah, I run Inspiring Philosophy. You can check out my YouTube channel, Inspiring Philosophy. Currently working on a three-part series on evidence for the Exodus. Part one and two are out right now. The title is Exodus Rediscovered. Uh, the second part is on the wandering period, Exodus Rediscovered wandering period. And the third one, which I think is going to be the best and have the most evidence, will be on the conquest coming out July 8th on my channel. That sounds like a big old waste of time. Um. <laughs> All right. So uh, everyone, if you're not following, if you're not following uh, IP's channel, you definitely want to check it out. Link is in the description box. He is. I can't say you're one of the original gangsters of YouTube. When did when did you start? Because we started in like 2009. What were you like 2013 ish or something like that? 2012. 2011. 11. Two, okay. End so that is 2011. Yeah. Okay. So that is. Uh, yeah. And then I, 2013 or so must have been when I started seeing your stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, wait. Yeah. So, okay. Now someone says turn up Mike's volume. What the heck? All right. No, that's not. That. That's not you. I can turn up your volume right in here. Okay. Go for it. I will turn you up slightly because everyone else said it's roughly even. Check. 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 Okay. All right. Checking. All right, guys. Just keep us updated along the way. Um, mm -hmm. it, just, just know if I catch you lying, if I catch you lying about the audio being uneven, and I realize that you're lying just to annoy me, then I will block you permanently and uh, not like you forever. All right. So, the Exodus. What got you into this topic, Mike? So, actually, uh, got me into it was a documentary, Patterns of Evidence. That's what first got me interested in it several years ago. I uh, discovered that Exodus documentary is crap, filled with errors. I uh, then moved to the early date for the Exodus, trying, which is where some scholars try to date, which is around 1446 BCE. Did a whole documentary on it. Then uh, Egyptologist David Falk basically debunked it. You can check out his channel, Ancient Egypt and the Bible. He's got some great stuff. So him and I redid it, arguing for the late date, which is placing the Exodus around 1265 BCE. So I've been studying this for several years, changing my view, trying to follow the data where it leads. And it seems like the most evidence, there's a ton of evidence for the Exodus in the 13th century BC, basically arguing for the date of around 1265 and a conquest about 40 years or so after that. All right. So you've got your documentary. Um, and I don't know a ton about this topic, so it looks like I'll just hand it over to you and you could go, you could go wherever you want it. I got some slides and stuff. I got so, some yeah. slides and stuff that you sent, but uh, so you're saying that it is a real event, uh, but with a slightly different timeline than most people would uh, would be yeah. arguing for. The reason is, is because people go to uh, the book of Kings and it says that Solomon built the temple 480 years after the Exodus and they go, okay, well that Solomon builds the temple 966 BC. Uh, then you can place the Exodus about 1446 BC. The problem with that logic is that we know from the ancient Near East that temple dedications used idealized numbers. We see this in Egypt. We see this in Assyria, uh, using numbers like 720 or 500 to commonly just sort of give like an idealized number for when the temples were constructed. They're not meant to be taken literal. 
Uh, what we do know is that in ancient Egypt, it says there was a city called P. Ramesses. And the book of Exodus says that the Hebrews built store cities at Pithom and Ramesses. Ramesses didn't exist until the 19th dynasty. So roughly around the time of about 1300 BCE. So that means Israel would still have to have been there to construct parts of the city. So the Egyptologists that believe there was an exodus believe it happened after the city of P. Ramesses was built. So that places the exodus about 1265 BCE. And that's where we see the majority of the evidence for the exodus. We do not see evidence for an exodus around 1446. I used to think we did, uh, but then I was corrected on that. There is there is just anything that early day proponents use to try to say an exodus happened around that date is riddled with problems. We see a ton of evidence around 1265, midway through the Ramazine period for an exodus. And that to me aligns more with the biblical account because it talks about the city of Ramesses. Uh, you can simply take the dates the, the Bible gives you in its cultural context to realize those are idealized numbers. They're not meant to be taken literal. Uh, and we know this from studying the biblical text in its cultural context. And uh, that uh, that is an interesting issue that keeps coming up, uh, especially in, in different areas. The idea of literary devices that people used back then that are unfamiliar to us, and therefore we, we sometimes don't get the point of uh, certain passages because we don't use we don't use those literary devices anymore. And uh, I, well, I think I, of a, here's a, here's a good one. Everyone has to agree with. If you go to Exodus four, uh, remember it's now, if you're going to take the dates literal, that Moses was in Egypt for 40 years, then he was in Midian for 40 years. Then he came back to Egypt and he was in, he was doing the Exodus and the wandering period for 40 years. So he's supposed to be in Midian for 40 years. But if you read Exodus four twenty, it says Moses took his wife and his sons and had them ride on a donkey. And they went back to the land of Egypt. So you're telling me Moses, who was got married when he went to Midian, at the, was there for 40 years. He had two adult sons, and he puts his two adult sons and his wife on a donkey? It seems unlikely that that would be the case. This is something James Hoffmeyer has brought up. It's more likely that his kids were still relatively young, and this is why they're able to all sit on one donkey. It's not the idea that you have two adult sons riding with their mother on a donkey you know, why aren't they with their own families at this point? Hmm. All right. So uh, later date, uh, what kind of evidence do you have? All right. Well, let's start with, can you put up the first slide one just so people can sort of see? I can and uh, I will. So this is a timeline. It just gives people an idea of when I'm placing the Exodus. You can sort of see this. This is how Egypt is. Um, actually, put up slide two. This is the Bronze Age. Uh, issues, how Canaan is. Right. There we go. So this is how Egypt is divided. You have Old Kingdom. Uh, that blue area is the first intermediate period, then the Middle Kingdom. Second intermediate period, New Kingdom. Exodus is going to happen in the New Kingdom. Most people think Joseph would have been a vizier during the second intermediate period, that little pink area right in there. Because And so basically around that time, uh, you have Joseph living. Uh, Israel, or Jacob, moves his family into Egypt and they settle there. Exodus opens by saying that a new pharaoh arose over Egypt that did not know Joseph. Well, we see there was a dynastic change there. The new kingdom or the 18th dynasty got going. And uh, when they took over, uh, Avaris was the capital of the uh, dynasty in the north, the 15th dynasty, reigning during the second intermediate period. According to the biography of Amos, the uh, general, General Amos, son of Abana, when they took the city of Avaris, this was a uh, Canaanite city, a lot of Canaanites there. Uh, when they took this city, they treated it like a foreign population and enslaved it. So it talks about him taking slaves. We know from archaeological evidence, there was no mass exodus at this point. They probably kicked out the rulers of Avaris when the 18th dynasty took over. But the majority of the Canaanite population that was in and around Avaris stayed there. And they were basically serving their new overlords during the new kingdom. So they're staying there. That correlates with Exodus 1 about a new pharaoh rising and treating the Israelites harshly. Again, no evidence of an exodus at this point. Early day proponents say an exodus happened during the reign of Amon-Hotep II. I used to think that it did not happen. 
What B Tech, Manfred B Tech, who is leading excavations on the site of Avaris, will tell you is that the site was in use up until about the Ram Ramazide period. And then midway through, the site was abandoned. And the Ramazide dynasty used the site as a graveyard. So around the time of where I have on this timeline of the Exodus, uh, or so around that time, we can't get an exact date or, or exact year, but Avaris is finally abandoned. And the Canaanite po population that was there went somewhere else. We also know at this site, there was no evidence of pig bones found. But it was very much a Semitic population, a lot of shepherds that had sheep and goats. Uh, B Tech says they were not from Egypt. They came from the Sinai or further. And they were there until about midway through the Ramazide period. So you can take that down now if you want. All right. So generally what we get is uh, Avaris has a Canaanite population. They're treated harshly. Uh, they're enslaved. They're there up until about midway through the reign of Ramesses or so, or you know, somewhere in there. And then the site's suddenly abandoned. And after that, the Ramazide population is using the site as a graveyard. The Canaanites or the Semitic people that were there left, they went somewhere else. But that very much aligns with what we would expect if there was an exodus. They were living at this site called Avaris, which is in the land of Goshen, according to the Bible. Uh, this would have been the city that Joseph would have been a vizier in, because this was the capital for the uh, dynasty reigning during the second intermediate period. Uh, and so they're there until about Ramazide period and they leave. So that's, uh, hmm. So that's your day. So, uh, by the way, um, it doesn't seem like anyone's labeling these like clearly, like these are the, the children of Israel and so on. So it's kind of, kind of looking for a oh i guess that's why why it would be called patterns of evidence in like a documentary right so it's not yeah it's not yeah, we, it's not we like, it's not we have this group here and we know this is this is who they were and so on it's uh here's a group that uh, was there and then they come up and then they come up missing so it looks like there was some sort of uh exodus and here are some things we can know about this group from when they were there and this fits well with the Exodus, um, but not with the traditional dating of the Exodus. Yeah. That about that about yeah. right? Yeah, it correlates. There, we don't. I mean, we don't have any inscriptions because again, this is in the Nile Delta. A papyrus just rotted away. We have scriptoriums that we know were there, and all the papyrus rotted away because this is not the dry climate, the dry areas of Egypt. This is where stuff is going to rot away. So we don't have any direct inscriptions. But we do know there was a Semitic population there that was uh, living there around this temple uh, to Set or Baal. Uh, and they were there up until the Ramazide period, and then they left, uh, correlating with the Exodus. Now that doesn't prove, but it's 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 as you suggest, it's a pattern of evidence that does align with the biblical account. All right, so is that what you got? So I got more though. <laughs> uh, but uh, first, I want to uh, bring up uh, a lot of people think the Bible says the Pharaoh drowned in the Red Sea. It actually doesn't. Uh, if you read Exodus 14, it talks about how uh, the Pharaoh was chasing, the army was chasing after the, the uh, children of, of Israel. Mm -hmm. um, it says he was, and then it says they went, they followed him to the sea, but it says then their wheels were getting clogged. So it says the chariot wheels were getting clogged, and they said that, uh, and then the Egyptians said, let us for, flee from before Israel, for the Lord fights for them against the Egyptians. So there's an indication that the Egyptians started chasing them into the Red Sea, and then they turned and started running. Uh, the Bible never says the Pharaoh drowned in the Red Sea. Even super, super conservative scholars like Douglas Petrovich will admit this. Uh, he is like as conservative as you get, like very fringe. He says, yeah, the Bible doesn't say the Pharaoh drowned in the Red Sea. James Hoffmeyer, Kenneth Kitchen, David Falk, they'll all say, yeah, the Bible doesn't say the Pharaoh drowned in the Red Sea, which fits with the data we see from the Ramazide period, because Ramesses II did not drown in the Red Sea. He lived well past the Exodus point and died in his old age. So it's very much the idea that the Egyptians were chasing them. They turned and fled. Uh, the waters would have came covered a large part of the army, but not all of it. Uh, it uses hyperbolic language to talk about the description, but the Pentateuch often uses hyperbolic language. I bring this up for a very important point because uh, I was looking in the Quran lately and it mentions several verses saying that the Pharaoh drowned in the Red Sea. 
we don't have any evidence of the pharaoh ever drowning in the Red Sea. We have no evidence of any pharaoh ever drowning or dying by drowning in the Red Sea from the New Kingdom. Uh, so what's interesting, though, is what the Bible leaves out, the pharaoh drowning in the Red Sea, the Quran adds in, and it becomes an error in that sense, because evidence we have from Egypt that any pharaoh died by drowning in the Red Sea. So the Quran actually has an error here, I would say, by saying in places like um, Surah 2840, Surah 17103, Surah 4355, that the pharaoh drowned in the Red Sea. So the Bible, interestingly enough, aligns with the evidence we have from Egypt about Ramesses' reigning past, but the Quran says that the pharaoh should have drowned in the Red Sea. Did you uh, did you want to take a look at, uh, at what the Quran says? Yeah, let's go for it. All right, I'm pulling up. The Quran. Alhamdulillah. <laughs> Let's see here. Uh, all right. We have the Quran here. We have 17, Surah 17, verse 103. Um, let me go with the Shakir translation. So he desired to destroy them out of the earth, but we drowned him and those with him all together. So drowned him and those with him. So that's 17103, uh, 2840, uh, I'll go with Shakir again. So we caught hold of him and his hosts, then we cast them into the sea, and see how was the end of the unjust. So that's Pharaoh, cast mm -hmm. into the sea. Let's see what else we got, 4346. And verily we sent Moses with our revelations unto Pharaoh and his chiefs, and he said, I am a messenger of the Lord of the worlds. And you get to 55, it then talks about the Pharaoh uh, being drowned after he has engagement with Moses. Let me scroll down through this. So Moses mm -hmm. and Pharaoh, Moses and Pharaoh, Moses and Pharaoh, Moses and Pharaoh, down to 55. So when they angered us, we punished them and drowned them every one. When at length mm -hmm. they provoked us, we exacted retribution from them and we drowned them all. Yeah, and I think it talks about another place about how the body of the Pharaoh is supposed to be like a, a, a to show this kind of thing that he was drowned, like as some sort of memory of this. And again, there's no evidence for Ramesses or again any Pharaoh, even if you take a different date for the Exodus, there's no evidence any Pharaoh ever drowned in the Red Sea. And it, uh, it, it have, wouldn't. Or, I, I I know you've looked into this, but I remember looking at this because this was a popular argument like back in 2005, 2006, where Muslims would argue that this has been verified, um, <laughs> that the that the Quran verse that talks about um, Pharaoh being preserved in his body, they were interpreting as uh, as God predict predicting that Pharaoh's body would be preserved as a mummy. And so they're saying that this is the Pharaoh of the Exodus and it's been confirmed because they, they have his body. And uh, what I recall looking into back then was one, didn't seem there was a lot of criticism on, on whether that was the correct Pharaoh. Um, two, the, the prophecy even is ambiguous it almost sounds like a contradiction because what it, it doesn't say allah will save your body it says allah will preserve you in your body so it makes it look makes it look there like it's contradicting other quran passages and saying that pharaoh's actually going to survive so allah was going to kill them was going to kill him but uh you know he changes his mind and is going to uh save him and then apart from that the pharaoh's body that they were pointing to there's no way that guy was rushing out and going into the the Dead Sea because he had all sorts of they, they've examined they've examined the mummy and this dude had all sorts of medical problems and would not have been put it this way he didn't die from from rushing into the the Red Sea um, right. he died from massive health problems that had built up over the years and so on is is the last person that would have been riding around uh, chasing chasing the children of Israel yeah I mean and. What's interesting is the Bible never says the Pharaoh drowned, and very, very conservative scholars will admit that, but the, the Quran is very explicit that he did in those passages. So again, uh, what is aligning with the archaeological data here? Uh, it's not the Quran, if that's what they mean. Uh, so this is actually a problem. Uh, but if you want, getting back to the data, we can start talking about the conquest, because this is where a lot of the data really is. Uh, There's well, a lot of interesting data. 
one second before we get into that. So the conquest um, we have from the goat Mario here. He says, Aaron Ra <laughs> has already debunked all of this. And as you know, Mike, when someone says that something has been debunked, by golly, it's it's been debunked. And it's not, it's not just like th there, there are people who will say whenever their guy has responded, they'll say, ah, you've been refuted because he said something in response to it. And so do you agree mm. or not? Why are you sharing this when you've already been completely debunked by Aaron Ra? I would really, really love to see what he's done. I have not seen the video, but <laughs> good luck. Uh, because he, I'm going to cite data here that just came out within a, a year or so, very new stuff. So a lot of, I would highly doubt I don't think he's anything recently on it, and I highly doubt he has mentioned the data that I'm about to cover. All uh, right. Well, we'll have to leave it up in the air for now as to whether Aaron Ra has debunked uh, all of this. Hey, then we have Black Angel here who says, whenever I listen to Inspiring Philosophy, I have the urge to make him a tea with honey. <laughs> okay. Appreciate that. Thank that's you. For your, that's for your throat. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, you, so you stop sounding like a... A kid. <laughs> oh, yeah, I know. Bad problems. Mike Lacone and I All right. Seen what the heck? Hey, we're rec we're live, dude. Hello, we're live. I'm looking for Bukhari. Bukhari's, Bukhari's right there, man. You see how these atheists are, man? You let one of these atheists into your house, and he just comes up and ruins your ruins your recording. What is this anyway? What are you doing there, man? We're recording. We're, it's, it's a guy who's like a thousand times smarter than both of us. So? I'm an atheist. <laughs> <laughs> nice. why, why are you not reading my comments, man? I, I, I see your comment right there. I already solved this problem, but I didn't see what you said earlier, so I don't even know what problem you're talking about. All the problems. All the problems. All right. Well, that was rude and just shows you the problem with uh, atheists lacking morality. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> On to the conquest. Right. So... Let's talk about Jericho, because the moment anyone mentions the conquest, an atheist or a skeptic will immediately bring up Jericho. There is no evidence Jericho was destroyed during Joshua's conquest. So some history here. Uh, when John Garstang first excavated the site, uh, he found the destruction there and dated it to around 1400 BC, which made a lot of early day proponents excited. Uh, they were like, great, this confirms the early date. Then Kathleen Kenyon went to the site and she said, no, based on dating methods, this destruction happened in 1550 BC. So long before the early date of the Exodus or the late date for the Exodus and conquest, long before that. Early day proponents have tried to say Kenyon is wrong with little success. Uh, uh, scholars like Bryant Wood have tried very hard to argue that that destruction should move to 1400. Uh, with little success, the overwhelming majority of archaeologists agree that's a 1550 destruction. But what people don't realize is that John Garstang actually identified t two destructions. The early one, which Kenyon dated the 1550, and he says there was a later one in his book, The Story of Jericho, on pages 123 to 124. He mentions this thing called the Middle Building, which was built on top of the earlier destruction and it had its own dis destruction by fire. So there likely was two destructions. Well, we didn't find any really good evidence that there was a second destruction for many decades after this. But we found out why recently, because there was an archaeologist who went to the, who released his latest reports, Lorenzo Nigro, uh, and he noted that the layers that date to the time of Joshua were cut in by later builders. So occupants from the iron age the roman byzantine periods they cut into the late bronze age layers removing them so the reason why we didn't find any evidence of a destruction during the time of joshua is because of uh destruction uh site leveling from later builders at the site so what basically happened was is the layers that would have revealed if there was or was not a destruction were cut in and removed and that's why there was they, they they were not finding this. So it's not that there is evidence. It's not that there the, the layers, the archaeological layers, show 
that there was no destruction. It's that they were removed, revealing whether or whether or not there was a destruction there. So those are interesting in the latest reports that came out. Uh, however, he did say something else that was interesting. He did note that uh, that there was, after the 1550 destruction, and if you want, you can put slide three up when I, I show this timeline. Uh, after the 1550 BC destruction, they did rebuild on top of the site with a fortified mud brick structure. Uh, the site was there uh, during 1400s, during the 1300s. Uh, we can see that there was a mock occupied structure. Then he says something interesting. He says, uh, Iron Age 1 was detected only in a few places on Spring Hill. Diagnostic ceramic material was dated to the 11th century BC. and may be related to a rural village that rose out of the ruins of the late Bronze City. In other words, we see there was a late bronze fortified structure that was there. And then in the Iron Age, it, it, something happened. We don't know because the layers have been cut into. But after that, we see there was just a rural village. So this is in Lorenzo Nigro's latest reports, the Italian Palestinian expedition to Tel as Sultan, ancient Jericho, 1997 to 2015. So essentially, the archaeological data does not contradict Joshua's conquest. It doesn't confirm it per se but it al at least it aligns with it. Because we've been told for decades now that Jericho debunks the Exodus because it shows there was no uh, destruction there. Well, the latest reports showed us that the reason why we weren't finding a, a destruction layer was due to site leveling. But we do see there was some sort of change that happened at the end of the late Bronze Age, which is around the time of the conquest. There was a mud brick fortified structure uh, that seems to have fallen into ruins somehow. And after that, a rural village arose onto the site. So despite what the uh, skeptics say, Jericho does seem to align with the biblical account. Although more data needs to come out, we need to figure out if we can find dig in other areas around the site to find those missing layers that later builders cut into. But that's what the latest evidence shows. It doesn't actually debunk the biblical account. It can align with it quite nicely. And uh, in random news, it looks like... Uh, <laughs> AP needs attention and uh, was upset that that he's being ignored while I live stream. <laughs> I like his ponytail. And needs to be. Yeah, it's isn't that is that a man bun? Is that what that's called? What is that? It's like what it's yeah. like what those yeah. it's like what those dudes who ride bicycle like those those tricycles for adults. No, I'm and, trying to be a samurai. All right. Well, he's he's dead set on distracting this entire thing. Again, that's what atheists do, right? Uh, it's like, oh, you guys are having a discussion about archaeological evidence and so on. So let me just be a distraction. One quick comment here. Uh, Bish Bish TV Worldwide says, David, I pray to you to be Muslim. Uh, Bish Bish, do not pray to me. Um, <laughs> Do not pray to me. I know you're used to praying to Muhammad all the time. You guys talk to him directly in your prayers. You say, peace be upon you, O prophet, as if he can hear you. So I know you're used to praying to Muhammad. Do not pray to me, please. All right. Just had to get that out of the way. All right. So we got the, uh, we got IPs dating for the Exodus. We have Jericho. You're saying mm -hmm. it can actually sure. fit. So what we have, let's say we have, we note that uh, at the uh, beginning of the New Kingdom, the population of Avaris was treated harshly and enslaved. They were there until about midway through the Ramazai period when the site was abandoned, turned into a cemetery. And about 40 years or so later, we see there's a change at Jericho. Not ex We can't get an exact year, but roughly around that same time period, there is a slight change, at least with Jericho. So we see there's some sort of pattern forming here. Let's also talk about the site of Hazor. Hazor is the... Um, it, Joshua is very specific that when they said they attacked the Northern Coalition, the only city they burned was Hazor. All, all the other cities they took as plunder, according to the uh, book of Joshua. They did not burn rampant through Canaan. Okay? They burned Jericho, Ai, and Hazor. Hazor very much aligns with the biblical account, like very much. Uh, because we do see around this exact time that Hazor was burned by fire. Uh, it was definitely burned. Excavations have revealed this over and over again. Uh, well, for example, Amon ben Tor will say, a fierce conflagration marked the end of the Canaanite Hazor. Across the site, a thick layer of ashes and charred wood in places three feet deep attests to the intensity of the blaze in the northern Galilee city. 
So there was a fiery destruction of Hazor at this exact same time, um, dating to sometime between 1250 BC and 1200 BC. So around the time we would expect Joshua to be there. Uh, one of the things they find interesting also at this site is that the idols were mutilated in similar fashion to what we see in terms of later Israelite customs of mutilating idols. So the idols at Hazor were mutilated. They were destroyed by the uh, invaders, similar to how the Israelites would mutilate idols in later periods. So Amon ben Tor again talks about uh, whoever burned the cities also deliberately destroyed statuary in the palace. Among the ashes, we discovered the largest Canaanite statue of a human form ever found in Israel. Uh, the head and hands of this statue and of several others were missing, apparently cut off by the city's conquerors. So we have a fiery destruction around the same time of Joshua that's said to be there. And the idols are destroyed in a very similar way to what the Israelite fashion was. Um, this is this is going off on a tangent here. But uh, Frank the Christian asked, uh, inspiring philosophy, are man buns pagan? Absolutely, they're pagan, AP. Man buns are so pagan. You know, I think I think pagans definitely had hair. And if you have hair, that's pagan. So you got to be careful with that. So just to be clear, just to be clear, uh, Christmas, not pagan. Uh, Easter, not pagan. Man buns, pagan. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. All right, you uh, you all heard it here. <laughs> now, he's, now he's trying on my various props. My goodness. Whole show ruined thanks to, uh, thanks to letting an atheist into my house. So, all right. All right. So we've covered three issues. Well, What's next? There's, there's even more. I mean, there is so much evidence. We're not gonna have time to cover it all. And it's all but fitting. It's all fit. It's all fitting in this general time frame. It all does. Yeah. Uh, my documentary coming out on July 8th on the conquest will cover all of this and more. I have a lot of internal evidence I can use from the Book of Joshua to also support the Exodus and conquest. But archaeologically speaking, we have more sites like the Mount Abal site. Uh, Joshua is commanded to build an altar to God on Mount Ebal. Well. Uh, Adam Zertel, who excavated the site, did find an altar up there. Uh, he said uh, no, a big, large structure that he called an uh, burnt offering altar. There was a ramp leading up to it, and he dated it to around 1225 BCE. Early day proponents now are trying really hard to say that that could date to 1400, but I can find nothing in the actual archaeological reports from Zertel or the archaeologists currently there that suggests it could ever be moved that far back. The earliest you can get it is around 1225 BCE. It cannot go back any further, but we do have this altar being built on Mount Ebal corresponding to the book of Joshua as well. So we see that was also happening. Uh, also interestingly tonight, the, the site of Shiloh is resettled at this point. Uh, Israel, of course, was at Shiloh in the book of Joshua. They're using the site as a cultic site. Uh, we see Israel Finkelstein, who is very skeptical of the Exodus, admits they were there, uh, and he even attributes it to very much to uh, Israelite uh, activity. So to quote from Israel Finkelstein in the Anchor Bible Dictionary, uh, pages 1069 <laughs> to 1072, the excavation results shed light on several aspects concerning the role of Shiloh in the Israelite settlement process. First, it is now clear that in the beginning of the Iron Age, uh, Shiloh was an outstanding there? candidate. What the heck? To become the... <laughs> Sorry. Stop Sorry. it, Amy. Sorry, gosh. It's like a little kid needs attention. We're talking about my goodness. <laughs> all right, all right, yeah. all right. Go where you. <laughs> so, go ahead. Was the outstanding candidate become the sacred center of the hill country population? Uh, so, since it was an ancient cultic site that now stood deserted in an area with only a sparse Canaanite population and a high concentration of Israelite sites. So, around the same time as the conquest, we see Shiloh is resettled and is used as a cultic site that has distinct Israelite features at this point. It does not have the distinct Israelite features. Prior to this, in fact, the Canaanites during the late Bronze Age started to abandon the site and became uh, out of use until beginning of Iron Age, around the same time as the conquest, we see this site is now being resettled. So we have Avaris abandoned about mid, about around 1265 BCE. Conquest, about 40 years later, Jericho changes, Hazor is burned, the Mount Ebal site is built, Shiloh is resettled. 
So we're seeing a pretty clear pattern here. There definitely is some evidence that corresponds to what we read in the Pentateuch in the book of Joshua. Um, before we go on, just had one question because you mentioned a documentary that is coming out. Mm -hmm. But you have on your channel, you have Exodus Rediscovered. That was posted three months ago. You have Exodus Rediscovered, the Wandering Period. Mm -hmm. So are these like uh, different installments? Then you have the biblical, then you had, a, no, that was a live stream, the biblical Exodus uh, answering objections. Mm -hmm. So what? what's the, uh, is, are you covering different issues as these are being released or you are saying I was wrong back then and here's my new view? No, this is all new stuff. The first one, Exodus Rediscovered, is just the evidence for the Exodus from Egypt. Mm -hmm. The uh, wandering period is about evidence for Israel's time in the desert when they're during their wandering period. And then the final video will be evidence specifically for the conquest. So we're going to start with going over Joshua, the site of Ai, Hazor, Abal, Shiloh, many other aspects as well. Uh, so that'll come out on July 8th. And so it's a three-part series dividing up the Exodus into the three stages of their journey. What about um, even earlier stuff? So you can go back a year ago to Israel in Egypt, biblical mm -hmm. archaeology. Yeah, that's stuff for evidence of possible correlations for the account of Joseph. Not a lot because that period of Egypt is very, we, very limited and fragmented. We don't have a lot of data from that period, but there are some interesting correlations. I also have a video up on Abraham showing that he likely lived during the Middle Bronze period. Uh, stuff like that as well. So, but the Exodus is where I'm now focusing on in conquest as well. All right. The floor is yours, sir, to continue. All right. So people really want to know. So let's think about this. So as I said earlier, when Avaris was abandoned during the Ramesside period, where did they go? Okay. We cannot prove they went to Canaan. We can only show correlations. But what we do see in Canaan about the beginning of the Iron Age, there is a population explosion that happens. Uh, so, for example, uh, William Deaver, who does not believe in an exodus, he says he talked about there are new Israelite sites that just pop up. He says the new Israelite settlements are all are almost all found founded de novo, not on the ruins of destroyed late Bronze Age sites, but in sparsely populated hill country extending from upper and lower Galilee into the hills of Samaria, Judah, southward and into the Negev. So we have this huge population increase. Kenneth Kitchen talks about how in some areas uh, we saw like roughly like a dozen sites in the late Bronze Age. Moving into the Iron Age, we see like 131 sites. Or we see in some areas uh, about a dozen sites go up to 200 sites, like very dramatically, very drastically. If you want, you can put up uh, the last timeline I have. Uh, I think it's slide four. You can sort of, and I sort of just give a rough take of like the population change. Like it's a sudden dramatic change so slight distraction here not the obvious <laughs> not the obvious one uh safraz hussein says devad would accept islam um i have no idea who devad would is or why he should accept islam but uh safraz you got some problems you got the most in order to accept islam you have to accept the most obvious false prophet in history I mean, every criterion you could come up with of, of how a person could show that he's a false prophet, Muhammad meets the criterion uh, more than anyone else in history. I'm not joking when I say most obvious false prophet in history. Um, and then you say, why should we believe in the most obvious false prophet in history? And you guys, your, your apologists make up stuff. Oh, because of the perfect preservation of the Quran. Well, the Quran ain't been perfectly preserved. What are you even talking about? Ah, but the miracles, the miracles of Muhammad. Uh, he didn't perform miracles according to the Quran. Ah, but the scientific miracles! You mean the book that says that the sun sets in a muddy pool and you can, you know, go there and there are people who live there? And th what, what are you talking about? So, I'm sorry, um, no one is going to accept Islam just because you say that we all need to accept the most obvious false prophet in history. Uh, I would believe that this guy's a prophet right here. I would believe that this guy's a prophet before I would believe that Muhammad's a prophet. I am. <laughs> 
All right. I, I apologize. We, we, we have interruptions coming from every direction now, like literally sure. in the room with me. Look, they're perfectly fine. So can you pull up uh, the chart of slide four, I think it is? Um, the chart? Or the uh, timeline slide four? The... No, wait a minute. Uh, slide five is the map. Let's see what, let's just see what these are. Slide four is, there oh, that's is. more yeah. of your timeline. Okay, that was, that's the one you want? Yeah. Okay. So yeah, you can see, basically I'm just giving a rough idea of what sort of happened around. The, so right around the time of the conquest, there was a huge population explosion in Canaan. Uh, so for the book, Archaeology of the Land of the Bible by uh, A. Mazar says, intense archaeological survey surfaces revealed an entirely new settlement pattern in Iron Age 1. Hundreds of new small sites were inhabited in the mountainous areas of the Upper and Lower Galilee in the hills of Samaria, in Afran, and in Benjamin, and in the northern Negev, and in parts of central and northern Transjordan. Much of this activity can be related to Israelite tribes. So they're basically saying that roughly around this time, huge population explosion, new sites everywhere. You can put up the next slide if you want, and this comes from William Deaver's book. Uh, he, he, again, He's skeptical that these people came from Egypt, but you can see these are all new sites that are just sort of appearing in Canaan around the same time that we would expect Joshua's conquest. So, uh, so it, just just to be clear, just to be clear, um, so these are uh, sites with people that are springing up that uh, people would grant. Hey, yes, these are you're having these uh, these spots of growing populations and so on and it corresponds to the time when you were pointing out another group was leaving but people wouldn't necessarily say that this is this is the same group that was leaving egypt well yeah it, it's weird it's just the virus is abandoned about 40 years earlier and then about a generation or so later all these new sites show up in canaan also, Hazor is burned. The Abal site is built. Shiloh is resettled. Jericho has changes. Uh, it just seems everything is correlating. And if you want, you can put up the last slide. And this comes from Lawrence Stagger's book. Or not his book, but his chapter in the book. All right. This so is, you can uh, see. This is actually bigger. I can scroll down if there's something you want to see. Uh, no, this about. comes from the book, The Oxford History of the Biblical World. Uh, Lawrence Stagger's chapter, and he shows the changes. You see in the first column, the late Bronze Age. These are the sites in those areas. Very little. All of a sudden, Iron Age. Look, some sites are you know quadrupling, you know quintupling, you know, you know dozens of just new sites, new population. Where did all these people come from? Uh, the the skeptical response is that this. This is what Israel Finkelstein and William Deaver will say: is that when the Middle Bronze Age cities collapsed around 1550, these people became nomadic shepherds and stayed in Canaan. Uh, they were just sort of there and be archaeologically invisible. And then they became Israel and resettled in the hill country, creating these new sites. That seems ad hoc a little unlikely. Uh, this is just a huge, huge amount of people. And so Kenneth Kitchen in his book on the reliability of the Old Testament responds to them saying, this just seems more likely this is about an influx of outsiders coming in. We also know during the late Bronze Age, Egyptian pharaohs like Tutmosis III, Amenhotep II, were depleting Canaan of its population, taking them back to serve as slaves in Egypt. So we know that a lot of people were taken back to Egypt. And we, what does the Exodus say? It says a mixed multitude went up with Israel. So it could have been a bunch of other Semitic people, groups, going back to Canaan during the Exodus. But we see this huge population explosion around the time of Joshua's conquest. It's possible that all these new sites come from Canaanites that were living as nomadic shepherds and were entirely invisible, and they just decided to settle, make all these new sites. It just seems far more like, likely that what's actually happening is an influx of outsiders invading, coming in and, and making these new sites. Uh, that, And of course, that aligns with the book of Joshua, the Exodus, this idea that there was these people that came in from the outside. And it seems to fit with a pattern we can see of evidence. We see that Avaris was abandoned. That site had no pig bones. 40 years later, all these new sites are popping up. Guess what? None of these new Iron Age 1 sites had pig bones. Hmm. And so it's a, it's kind of like a, because you don't have a lot of the direct 
evidence or inscriptions or act you know sources outside the bible for uh, a lot of the details it's like archaeology um yeah it's it's kind it's kind of like a mystery and trying to you know what i mean trying well, to like solve the mystery and, and fit and see what see what actually fits and so well, your we, point your point is that it actually fits well, yeah, and we do have an inscription that mentions Israel and Canaan at this point. The Merneptah Stila, that dates to 1208 BC, says Israel is in Canaan at this point. So uh, we know they were there present around this time. So we can, so if we know they were there, we could. They're already a very likely candidate for the destruction of Hazor, the Abal site, the Shiloh resettlement, uh, the changes at Jericho. The Merneptah Stila directly says they're there in 1208 BC. So they're already known as like a group of people there at that point. We don't ever see them mentioned in any sort of inscription prior to this. So there is no mentioning of them, despite people's misuse of the Berlin Stille. There is no mentioning of them prior to this point. They are not there until uh, the first inscription of Israel is 1208 BC in the Merneptah Stille, saying they're in Canaan. So we already have Egypt attesting Israel is there. So we don't have to. So why would we come up with alternative explanations to explain why Hazor was destroyed? changes at Jericho, the Apollo site, the population explosion, when Egypt is already telling us that Israel was there. Um, little side, little side. I have no idea why so many people from so many directions are trying to distract everything. David Wood, please don't retire. Don't let the Momo Circus continue unchallenged. Guys, have you ever heard me say one word about retiring? No. You've heard me say, no, quit, quit reading, quit reading titles of videos and not paying attention to anything I say in the video and then responding based on the title of a video that you didn't watch. Uh, one more here. Rum Runner. No, God. Rum Runner. This is what? He says, now this is, this is funny because, I mean, this is a, this is a common Muslim response when they're, when they're desperate to show that, uh, that Jesus was violent too. Notice when you point out that Muhammad had sex with a little girl, they, aha, but Mary was young too. They try to turn everyone into pedophiles in order to defend one pedophile. Um, yeah. And then and then when you point out Muhammad called for the violent subjugation of the world and told everyone to go around uh, slaughtering people in his name, uh, then what do they do? And instead of defending him, they try to make Jesus sound the same. And this is one of the main ones, but the guy's channel's name is Rum Runner. And it's not like it's not it's not an Islamic channel. So I don't know if this guy absorbed the the same stupid arguments and so on. Uh, I hate to do this IP, but uh, I do love exposing uh, a lot of nonsense. So let me just scan this real quick. Like, uh, just oh, take yeah, a, I know this just take a quick look at the at the passage here. So what our friend Rum Runner is pointing out is. Yeah, if you go right down here and you ignore all the rest of the whole passage, but as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. You see there, that's Jesus saying, but as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. You see, it's Jesus telling his followers to go on a killing spree. But now I'm confused. Why didn't Peter and John and James, why didn't they go on a killing spree right after Jesus commanded them this? Oh, because it's a story. <laughs> now look, it's a parable. Now look, we just go back. Look what happens when we actually read things in context. Here we go to verse eleven. As they heard these things, he proceeded to tell a parable, <laughs> because he was near to Jerusalem. Look, look at verse twelve. He said, therefore, a nobleman went into a far country to receive for himself a kingdom and then return. Calling ten of his servants, he gave them ten minas and said to them, engage in business until I come. And then so he leaves. He eventually comes back, finds out that uh, some people have rebelled against them. And then the king, the nobleman in this story, at the end of it says, but as for these enemies of mine who did not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me. So following this logic, since I just read the story, you could quote me and say, ah, but here's David saying, but as for these enemies of mine who do not want me to reign over them, bring them here and slaughter them before me, because I said it while telling a story. Mm -hmm. This is just amazing stuff, man. This is, this is amazing stuff. You can literally be telling a story and say, hey, this character in my story says this, and then you see, you said it. <laughs> and what's, fun, what's funny is like, you expect like stupid people to use this, right? Uh, because I mean, you 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 actually have to be, you, you have to be stupid or or very poorly informed, 
um, or deceptive. Those are, those are the options if you're using this. But keep in mind, people like Ahmed Didat and Zakir Naik are the ones who use this and popularize it, right? So these are, these are Islam's most popular apologists, completely distorting and misrepresenting the words of Jesus in order to deflect attention from Muhammad. What a religion, mm -hmm. man. What a religion. All right. <laughs> Yeah, it's, Sorry, about, it's what aboutism. It's what aboutism. It doesn't actually make us like Muhammad anymore. Uh, it just reminds us, oh, yeah, he's a bad guy. You keep comparing him to all these bad things you think happened. Like, that doesn't yeah, and, help. And it's funny. I mean, like, so you have what aboutism when it's correct, right? You say, ah, but what about this other thing that is correct? When it's Muhammad ordering his followers to violently subjugate the world, and you say, ah, but what about Jesus saying, right? And he doesn't say it. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> it's, yeah. Oh, Muhammad had sex with a nine-year-old girl, but what about Joseph and Mary? And That's then it's insane. wrong. And then it's, it, my goodness, what a religion, man. What a religion. All right, back to you. To So, uh, so briefly cover what mm -hmm. we kind of got here. So again, this is only scratching the surface. I'm going to go through 19 archaeological data, data points in the full three-part series that I'll cover in the conquest, plus over roughly 30 points of internal evidence confirming the Exodus conquest. But what we argue here tonight is that we can see that the population of Avaris, which was in what the Bible calls the land of Goshen, was enslaved after a dynasty change. They were there until about the Ramazide period. Their site had no evidence of pig bones. The site was abandoned around the time of Ramesses. About a generation or so later in Canaan, there's a change at Jericho. The Abal site has been settled. Shiloh has been resettled. Hazor is destroyed. Uh, we see a population explosion. And Egypt admits in the Merneptah Sile Israel is present there in Canaan. My question is this, why posit a different theory for Israel's origin than what they're telling us in their own ancient texts when so much evidence is already aligning as it is? Why are we going to posit uh, that, oh, no, there was no Exodus, they just made it up? Because now you got to explain why they would make up the book of the Exodus and come up with alternative explanations for why Hazor was burned or why this population explosion has happened. You're multiplying entities beyond necessity. It seems we can explain this pattern of evidence we have found with an exodus account which is what israel told us we don't have to come up with different explanations here so it just seems it's like a simpler explanation and none of this would actually uh, uh, prove god exists it does support the biblical reliability but you can have and believe there was an exodus account like it doesn't i don't see why would you want to even just reject that entirely it seems entirely fair you could have this could all just have been a natural event and people interpret it as god's will it's god acting but it can still confirm an Exodus account. I don't see why skeptics go so far as to just deny the Exodus. Yeah, there is a, I mean, if there was just absolutely nothing that fit and so on. And so if you just had the Bible and it was the Bible versus everything else, then obviously if you don't take the, the Bible as an authoritative source and it's it's going against everything else, then you'd, you'd see the problem and not want to take it seriously. But uh, th there is this issue. And same thing with the New Testament of, people not wanting to treat the Bible as any kind of source at all, which seems insane to me, right? You, you, you've, got, you've got grades here. So you've got inspired, inerrant word of God, and then you go all the way down to, okay, these are some ancient, docu ancient documents written by people who weren't inspired. Well, I mean, like, I don't believe the Quran was inspired. I still believe you can learn all sorts of stuff about the beliefs of the people at the time and learn all kinds of things about what was going on because it's it's a it's an an old source. Um, and so it it is just weird, right? That uh, so you'll historians will find all of these details that line up that match up with Jesus, but you'll 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 have people that if the Bible is your source about something, then even if all the stuff we know historically fits with the, the biblical picture of Jesus, they're, they're just, there are people out there who won't count the Bible as any kind of source at all. And so looks like we have something similar with the Exodus. Uh, so the question you asked was, why are you not, if you've got all these details and they fit with this picture, and then you've got this book, which is explain, which is tying everything together and telling you how this happened, why is that just being automatically discounted and saying this has this has nothing to do with our picture? Here are the things that we know from outside the Bible. Wait, did you say you have grapes? You trying to you trying to man eat some grapes, dude? What the heck? <laughs> Sorry. So, so, 
So I also want to add that I'm not coming up with this stuff on my own. I'm getting this from experts, Egyptologists. So my three-part documentary series, including part three that's coming out on July 8th, uh, Egyptologist David Falk helped extensively with this. You can check out his channel on YouTube, Ancient Egypt and the Bible. He's got a lot of good stuff there, but he's helped extensively with this. So I've been working with experts. Uh, scholars like Joshua Berman and Mark Chavales have reviewed these and offered criticisms and changes for me to make, as well as Benjamin Noonan, another biblical scholar. So I'm trying to work with scholars here on this. This is not just me coming up with this stuff on my own. Okay, I'm not, not that special. I'm getting this from the experts themselves, Egyptologists, biblical scholars. All the evidence points to an exodus and conquest at this time. There is a lot of evidence pointing there. So we have enough, I would say we have more than enough to confirm an exodus just from what I've given you tonight. And this is only scratching the surface. I have so much more data to cover on July 8th. Um, so that is, you know, it's funny. I was about to say, I was about to say, hey, uh, give me the links to your ongoing series. And so I can add that to the description box or add it as a, as a pinned comment. Uh, and then I was going to say, hey, and I'll go ahead and link to, I'll go ahead and link to your, <laughs> to your one in July. And I was like, wait a minute, this channel's deleted July 4th. <laughs> so that's not going to work. So uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, be sure to subscribe to IP's channel so you can get that. If you're clicking on this right now, it's uh, probably a topic you're interested in. So definitely subscribe to his channel. Uh, you can check out some of his other videos on this topic uh, that he's made so far. And then you said July, you said July 8th for the new one? Yeah, July 8th will be the Conquest one. Uh, then we'll probably, I'll probably do another hangout with David Falk uh, and we'll uh, do, do a, deal with objections from skeptics against the Exodus. Uh, so we'll cover some of that stuff there as well. But yeah, July 8th is the date for the final one and that's going to have the most evidence in my view. Um, all right, well, so uh, they got your views uh, going through the timeline here and nowhere to get more. Uh, any uh, final thoughts before I shut down and beat the crap out of this apostate behind me for <laughs> well just you can also just remember all of this data also helps support the unreliability of the quran because again they say the exodus pharaoh drowned in the red sea james hoffmeyer can't catch it even ultra conservative scholars like douglas petrovich will say the bible never says that the archaeological record does not indicate any new kingdom pharaohs ever drowned in the red sea so this is a problem for the Quran, but it's not a problem for the Bible. The Bible can fit with the archaeological data quite well. Interesting, interesting stuff. All right, so yep, we will definitely all be uh, all be checking that out. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I have this, I have this amazing inclination to keep to tell people to come back for the the link. <laughs> And this channel's not going to be here. It's so it's so funny. <laughs> All right, so uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, if you're not familiar, I mean, you've been on with me several times right now. I, I want to say, hey, if you if you don't know who, if you're not following Inspiring Philosophy, then I mean, it's kind of your fault, right? It's like mm -hmm. it, it's not like like there are new channels. There are new channels and stuff where I would say, hey, make sure you follow this guy's channel because he's new and you don't know him. But if they don't know you by now, there's something uh, something just wrong with him. So if there, there's a uh, if there's uh, anyone out there who is not following uh, Inspiring Philosophy, definitely, definitely, definitely check that out. Uh, he is going into a into uh, some great depth on a lot of topics that are very relevant uh, to. Uh, Christians and to critics of Christianity. So definitely, definitely uh, check out that channel. Who's was that guy again? Was he a YouTuber? Something? My goodness, man. <laughs> <laughs> everyone, everyone stop right now. Uh, sorry, uh, Inspiring Philosophy, Mike Jones. Uh, stop for a second. Everyone just give uh, the apostate prophet attention here because he obviously needs attention. Okay, I'll just wait. He should be your hype man. Be back there like beatboxing or like yeah. hyping you up. Like, oh snap! That that's what he that that would be cool. We should do a live stream one day where we bring hype 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 men hype guys and like everything we say, someone's in the background. Oh, <laughs> that would be like a that would be like a Muslim debaters like dream fantasy to be doing an online debate like this, but have a whole crowd behind him to uh, to uh, shout that he's making great points. Um, it helps to cover up the bad points. All right. Well, uh, thanks for joining us. 
Mike Jones and everyone follow the channel and don't worry when the documentary comes out next month we'll find a way to get it to you if uh, this channel happens to be destroyed on the 4th which it will <laughs> alright catch y'all later Wait, can I ask a question quickly? what? I want to ask uh, IP a question before you leave yeah go ahead hurry up is it true that uh, IP will uh, is never going to give you up never going to let you down <laughs> never going to run around you don't even know the words man yeah I forgot I don't never going to give sorry. you up never going to let you down I don't know the words either fuck <laughs> you <laughs> He just Rick very, rolled everyone. <laughs> he just Rick rolled everyone. All right. No more Rick rolling. <laughs> Catch y'all later.